We start from the premise that the defense and security industries are actually producing insecurity and that profit generation plays a main role in this dynamic. Over the course of this session, we will try to answer the following questions. How do arms manufacturers and the general corporate sector influence our society and politics to gain financial and ideological support for their aims? How does the European Union externalize its border security and who is influencing the related policies? Lastly, what can be done to restrain the industry's destructive expansion? To discuss these questions with us, we have invited Shana Marshall, Associate Director of the Institute for Middle East Studies, author of Middle East Armies and the Global Military Industrial Complex, and currently doing research on patterns of military entrepreneurship in Egypt, Jordan, and the United Arab Emirates. Also joining us is Stephen Semler, a former lobbyist on Capitol Hill and expert on U.S. military finance. Stephen is co-founder of the Security Policy Reform Institute, a grassroots-funded think tank promoting a working-class approach to U.S. foreign policy. Stephen is also author of the newsletter, Speaking Security, available on Substack. Lastly, to discuss these questions with us is Mark Ackerman, researcher on arms trade and border militarization at the Transnational Institute and Stop Wappenhandel. His recent publications include Outsourcing Oppression, How Europe Externalizes Migrant Detention Beyond Its Shores, and Financing Border Wars, The Border Industry, Its Financiers, and Human Rights. Um, greetings and welcome to the second session of the Alternative Security Conference. Um, I would like to uh, welcome our guests, uh, Mark Ackerman, uh, Stephen Zemla, and Dr. Shana Marshall. And thank you all for joining us. Um, so first, just uh, to give uh, an outline for the, of the session for our audience, that uh, this session will be uh, split into three parts. First, we have a, a 10 minutes monologue for, from each of our, of our guests, for, followed by a 30 to 40 minutes uh, panel discussion. And then finally, we will have a Q&A session. So for our audience, if you have any questions or comments, just put it on the chat on your right-hand side. Um, so let's uh, let's start first with our, our with, uh, guests' uh, presentations. So first, we uh, Mark will we will hear from Mark Ackerman. Mark will uh, elaborate on how the EU externalizes its borders and how European arms industries uh, make profit from conflicts abroad and from the increase in the security app domestic apparatus. Please, Mark, uh, the virtual stage is yours. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, let me first start by telling a bit about EU arms exports, because they are connected to all this. Uh, the countries of the EU together are the second largest arms exporter in the world, after the USA, and are responsible for about a quarter of the global total. During the last decade, over 450,000 arms export licenses worth 276 billion euros have been granted in the EU. The largest customer was Saudi Arabia. Other important export destinations outside the EU include India, the USA, Egypt, Algeria, the United Arab Emirates, Qatar and Turkey. Or in other words, massive amounts of European arms end up in countries at war with internal conflicts, authoritarian regimes, and human rights violations. European arms exports have, for example, kept the Yemen war going and contributed to the violence, repression, and chaos in the Middle East and North Africa. European arms companies, BIA systems, Airbus, Leonardo, and Thales are among the largest military companies in the world and are the main winners of European arms exports. Now, the EU has arms export rules, eight criteria from the so-called common position, which should prevent exports to countries at war and human rights violators. Each member state is responsible for implementing these criteria when granting or refusing an arms export permit. Because of the vagueness of the criteria, however, this has led to vastly different arms export regimes between member states, ranging from somewhat strict to very permissive. While some countries have halted or restricted arms exports to Saudi Arabia, for example, others have, on, have gone on providing large amounts of arms for the Yemen war. Repeated attempts to come to an EU arms embargo against Saudi Arabia failed. 
With or without an embargo, the EU arms exports criteria, which member states are bound to implement, have not prevented these highly problematic arms exports, as well as many others fueling war and human rights violations all over the world. Other interests prevail. President Macron of France stated last December, the severe human rights concerns regarding Egypt shouldn't stand in the way of arms exports to the authoritarian regime of Sisi, because it is more important to cooperate with it in the war on terror and to help build its military capacities. These permissive export policies are not a coincidence. They must be seen in the context of EU foreign military and trade policies that are all aimed at arms export promotion. A leading role in this is played by EU funding for research and development of new arms and security technologies. For the next seven years, the EU will spend a total of 8 billion euros for the development of new arms under the new European Defence Fund. The lobby of the arms industry has been very influential in setting up this fund, as well as other financial instruments to its benefit. The regulation for the Defence Fund was based on an advisory report of a so-called group of personalities, made up majority of representatives of the military and security industry, turning it into foremost a subsidy tool for the industry. The EU promotes the defense funds as part of its attempts to build more of its own military capacities, echoing calls for higher European military budgets and less European dependence uh, on the USA within NATO. It states that a stronger European arms industry is needed for these efforts and emphasizes that in turn, this industry's global competitiveness needs to be improved. This means more European arms exports to strengthen European military cap capabilities. A coalition of armed forces, the military industry and right-wing politicians constantly pushes for higher military budgets and more arms purchases in general. However, the lobby of the military and security industry has broader goals than more funding, higher budgets, and more support for arms exports. Seeking new markets after the end of the Cold War and a temporary decrease in military global spending, then it has moved into other areas as well. Industry representatives have been successful in positioning themselves as experts on rising global political problems and phenomena, such as climate change, pandemics, and migration. In all instances, they have been embraced by authorities in framing these developments as threats and security problems. This process of so-called securitization leads to le looking for militarized answers, happily provided by the military and security industry, presenting itself and its goods and services as a solution to deal with these problems. Uh, we'll now zoom in on the issue of migration and border militarization. Ever since the establishment of the Schengen area in the early 1990s, the EU has been building up security and control at its external borders, which has seen an extreme escalation since the so-called refugee crisis of 2015. This has included sending military forces to the borders, the use of military equipment to stop migration, including drones and other autonomous systems, the expansion of biometric border control systems, and the introduction of artificial intelligence for border control. The same large, large arms companies mentioned before, in particular Airbus, Leonardo and Thales, are the main beneficiaries of the European spending spree for border security. As cynical as it is, they profit twice at the expense of refugees, first by fueling the reasons people are forced to flee with arms exports for war and repression, second by providing the equipment to stop them on their migration journey. The EU border guard agency Frontex has seen a fast expansion of its organization, budgets and tasks since its establishment in 2005. Starting with a budget of 6 million euros in that year, this is now over 90 times as high, with 544 bill, million euros in 2021. Under the current multi-annual multi financial framework, the seven-year EU budget Frontex gets at least uh, 5.6 billion euros. Another 6.5 billion euros is reserved to fund member states' measures to strengthen border security, including purchasing military equipment under the new integrated border management fund. And under other financial instruments, billions more are bound to go to EU member states, candidate member states, and third countries for similar objectives. Frontex will use part of its billions to build a 10,000 person standing border guard corps and to buy or lease its own equipment for border security. A first large contract was issued last autumn, 50 million euros for drone surveillance services in the Mediterranean from Airbus, Israel Aerospace Industries and Elbit. 
This means Israeli killer drones, which are promoted as being tested on Palestinians, are now targeting desperate people looking for safety and a better life. The pushbacks and violence at the borders in which Frontex is involved are a consequence of Europe's obsession with keeping or getting refugees out and the subsequent border militarization. This also forces migrants to more dangerous routes, leading to an increase in the relative death toll amongst migrants coming towards Europe and drives them into the hands of criminal smuggling networks. In other words, the EU creates the market it says it wants to fight. Boosting and militarizing border security and control is not something that is only happening at the external borders of the EU. The EU and its member states put pressure on third countries, using a carrot and stick approach to act as outpost border guards to stop migrants before they reach Europe. This process of so-called border externalization goes accompanied with military training, advice, funding for purchases of border security and control equipment, and donations of such equipment. The EU pours billions of euros in a wide range of projects in this field. This is serious and far-reaching consequences, and not only for migrants. Once again, these policies lead to pushing refugees to more dangerous routes and into the hands of smuggling networks. But they also legitimize and strengthen authoritarian regimes, in particular the military and security forces, undermine migration-based economies, destabilize fragile states, divert development corporation spending, and are effectively a clear example of neocolonialism. Again, the arms industry is one of the few winners. Some striking examples, the EU and Italy together paid the Italian arms company Leonardo some 500 million euros to construct a border security system along Libya's southern border. This project dates back to the Gaddafi regime and has been stalled since the start of the civil war, but is still being negotiated for a restart. Germany donated tens of millions of euros worth of border security equipment from Airbus to Tunisia and is closely cooperating with Egyptian security forces for border security and many other purposes. France's public-private company Civipol, owned by the state and large arms companies, was selected to set up fingerprint databases of the whole population of Mali and Senegal uh, with 53 million euros funding from the EU Emergency Trust Fund for Africa. One of the objectives seeking to identify irregular migrants from both countries in Europe and being able to deport them. Such external policies to pursue Europe's own interests by providing arms and security equipment, giving military training and donating money aren't confined to migration. The Merkel government in East Germany has been the leading proponent of providing more arms to European countries, arguing, arguing that helping build their military capacities and extensive security infrastructures will lead to more stability around Europe. In reality, this will lead to providing tools for repression and to pumping arms in a highly volatile, conflict-ridden region. Such policies are bound to result in more forced migration in the future and continuing the cycle of keeping out the consequences of EU arms exports and broader foreign and military policies by ever strengthening and expanding fortress Europe. As human costs will rise, the arms industry profits will increase. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Mark, for this uh, interesting and insightful uh, information. Uh, I guess we'll, we'll have some questions about it uh, or to have it in our discussion in the second section. Uh, so now we go to Stephen Zamler. Uh, Stephen will elaborate on the influence of the arms industries uh, in Washington, D.C., and how think, think tanks work in general and what this meant by revolving doors. So please, Stephen, the virtual stage is yours. Thanks, appreciate it. Um, earlier this over the weekend, there was a report out by the Stockholm uh, International Peace Research Institute that showed that the United States is again the world's leader in military spending, and it's not clearly close either. This is at a far distant first, and one of the one of the things that an excessively high military budget does is that it drives future military budgets up and increases the likelihood that the next one and the one after that will be high as well. And the primary driver is the privatization of funds. So the pool of funds that the U.S. government publicates to the military every year are public funds, meaning that they come from the U.S. taxpayer or more specifically the U.S. Treasury. And about 50 to 60 percent of the total uh, Pentagon budget, military budget, goes to private contracts. 
And there are about 50,000 private contractors out there, but it's the space is dominated by the top five or 10. So for example, the top five military contractors, they eat up about a third of all contracts each year. And these, in these top five, they obligate a lot of funds to think tanks, to lobbyists and to campaign contributions. But going back to just the share of uh, funds that are privatized each year in 2017, the US military budget just for the Department of Defense was 610 billion. And the total number of contracts obligated that year was 328. Now in 2020, the military budget rose 130 billion to 741 billion, about 438 billion, which is a 110 billion increase um, from 2017 went to contracts. So it's one of these things where the number of contracts tends to stay stable over time at about 60% of the DOD budget. And once those funds are privatized, um, they're privatized for uh, contractors to build military equipment, to arrange services for the military, et cetera. But a lot of it uh, is sort of fed back into the system um, to make sure that those military budgets stay high because it's where they derive most of their bottom line. Um, Lockheed Martin, for example, which is the top military contractor pretty much year after year. Last year, uh, and in 2019, it was about 70% of their total company revenue came from the U.S. government, and that excludes arms sales. In total, Lockheed relied on the U.S. government either for uh, arms sales approval or direct contracts from the government, um, upwards of 97% of their total revenue. So these are really effectively i mean this is a, a system that should be nationalized because it basically already is it's just that there are private sectors that sort of intervene um that sort of inject themselves into the system um and create um a, a profit incentive into an otherwise kind of boring system of government contracting so one of the ways that the military industrial complex works is that these private firms give campaign contributions to members of Congress. Now, those familiar, not familiar with the US government, um, Congress is the one that ultimately writes the checks. It's the one, it's the, it's the, lead, it's the body that uh, controls the purse strings of the US government. Without sort of congressional authorization, the president can't just spend the money, it has, it has to go through Congress. So when you hear something saying like, oh, Trump increased military spending over, $130 billion, that required a lot of Democratic votes too, as well as Republicans, so it wasn't just Trump himself doing it. One of the effects um, of campaign contributions on Congress is that it makes them more likely to vote for military increases and reject uh, decreases to military spending. So for example, last year there was a vote uh, introduced by a representative uh, that would have cut Pentagon spending by 10%. Um, it failed. But looking at the vote count, members who voted for the bill, uh, who voted for uh, a defense cut, took three times less uh, cash from military contractors than those who voted against it. So regardless of whether you're looking at that particular amendment or sort of uh, the annual spending bills, if you're in advocacy and you're looking for people, members of Congress to get on your side to reduce military spending, a good place to start is to look at how much cash they have uh, from military contractors, because the ones who take not a lot of money are the ones who you know, may have a poor voting record with those. You'll have a much easier time convincing those people, usually, especially among Democrats, than members of Congress who take a lot. Um, now, it also, um, you know, these private contractors also give a ton of money to think tanks, over $1 billion, um, uh, went from the government or the private military contractors to uh, think tanks between 2014 and 2019. And the purpose of think tanks is to make the stuff that these weapons manufacturers say, um, sort of their, their blind capitalist interest of, of wanting to increase their bottom line, it makes those demands seem a bit more, uh, it makes them seem normal or reasonable or even appropriate, really. Because if, 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 um, if a contractor says that China is a threat, uh, 
people will question uh, its legitimacy because obviously it's a military contractor and it wants to increase bottom line. And by situation China as a threat, then they're able to increase their, you know, produce, you know, sort of the outcome they want to. But because in order for them to be taken seriously, they have to have sort of, uh, they have to have a sort of uh, sheath of believability or science or scientific evidence or professionalism. And that sort of incentivizes their giving to think tanks, which provides sort of a, a, a basis in scholarship for their claims that are profit driven. Now, I mean, it's not it's not necessarily conspiratorial. I mean, a lot of people believe in these think tanks believe what they say when they say that the US should increase military budget by 100 billion. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it isn't a problem because just because a person there and believes what he or she's saying, there's a lot of other people who would argue the opposite who wouldn't be hired by that think tank. So it sort of gives you an idea of just um, how the the interest of military contractors side of sort of not only reaches uh, members of Congress directly, but also through uh, the public to the public by, you know, sort of funding different think tank reports. The final uh, area I want to touch on is lobbying and lobbying. Um, the difference between advocacy and lobbying is that lobbying involves a specific um, intervention on an active piece of legislation. So if you testify in front of Congress as an expert, that's not lobbying. Um, but the benefit that lobbying has over advocacy is that it's usually direct interdiction for a piece of legislation. So if a certain member of Congress is debating um, to reduce military spending, um, the military industry can deploy sort of a team of lobbyists and they do every year to sort of keep military spending from being you know, intercepted by other forces coming from outside. So at the beginning to summarize, Basically, you have campaign cash flooding in, sort of setting the bottom line and sort of greasing the wheels for this system for uh, members of Congress to be favorable uh, to increasing the military budget. They um, fund think tanks to make that sort of seem logical or respectable or somehow rooted in erudition and not greed. And lobbying sort of keeps the system going by making sure that if there's a letter issued by progressive groups, for instance, that can be struck down very easily just by um, just deploying of a team of lobbyists to make sure that uh, to keep members in line, so to speak. Um, so I'm open to any questions and I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Mm. Uh, thank you, Stephen. This is uh, very interesting and also raises a lot of questions that we were, I can, for sure we have uh, an interesting discussion afterwards. Um, so lastly, uh, we would hear from Dr. Marshall. Uh, Dr. Marshall will elaborate on how the transnational capital uh, facilitate arms trade and what to, what is meant by offsets and how it uh, introduces also corruption in, in different states. So please, Dr. Marshall, the virtual stage is yours. Thanks. Um, first of all, thanks for having me. I'm very excited um, to be here and to hear um, everyone's questions and the excellent research being done by other scholars and organizations and um, advocacy organizations. Um, so um, I think it's it's super important that we think about how the global military industrial complex and the global arms trade is intertwined um, with the financial industry, especially in this sort of contemporary stage of, of financialized capitalism or late stage capitalism with financial inflections. Um, so on the one hand, uh, there's this story of, of excess capital, right? And the increasing influence of the financial industry globally. Um, and then you simultaneously have um, increasing militarization and increased uh, investment in weapons production, um, intelligence applications, border security, homeland security, um, machine learning for uh, military applications. Et cetera, et cetera. Um, so you have these sort of uh, uh, bizarre financial innovations and neoliberal fantasies that we've seen um, sort of laid bare in the uh, multiple <laughs> recent financial crises that we've had. Um, and those are also reflected in the military industrial um, 
complex, the, the global, in the global sense. So all of this excess um, investment capital that's being generated by this extreme wealth inequality is, is combined with imperialism and war and the drive for um, new weapon systems, uh, developing next generation systems and the proliferation of those systems and has uh, sort of given birth to this new uh, niche area in the global financial industry um, that's called offset brokerage um, or defense offsets. Some um, people call them industrial participation agreements. Um, they have lots of different um, names in industry um, and according to sort of government and uh, military industry officials that talk about them. But um, essentially what they are at is uh, investment agreements that are attached to arms sales contracts. And they're offered by defense firms um, as sort of a, a sweetener to encourage uh, countries to purchase uh, weapons from that particular firm. So this is a hypothetical example, um, just to give you an idea of what it is. But say Lockheed Martin um, sells a uh, billion dollars of uh, fighter jets to Saudi Arabia. So Saudi Arabia has a regulation that uh, a third or you know 33% of the contract value um, has to be reinvested in the Saudi economy by the defense firm, in this case, Lockheed Martin. Um, so obviously that's an enormous number. Um, there's no way that a private firm <laughs> could uh, turn around and take 33% um, of its contract value and invest it in the purchasing country unless the contract itself was inflated to such a degree that it ended up covering not only the cost and the profit margin, but also the offset agreement or the offset investment that is signed as a part of the, the sales contract. Um, and so I was actually, I was really interested in, in looking at um, how militaries in the Middle East um, were able in the era of, of liberalization to sort of um, uh, grow their own, grow the number of factories and, you know, auto dealerships and other enterprises um, that they had control over. And I happened along a bunch of uh, U.S. government documents that had been misplaced in an archive that were uh, from the General Accountability Office, which is like the U.S. government's auditor um, that we're asking about these offset contracts um, because countries in the Middle East that were getting uh, free weapons through uh, uh, military assistance funds were then going back to the defense firm and asking for, you know, 30 percent in offsets. And this was upsetting a lot of U.S. congressmen because they had uh, military subcontractors and suppliers in their district who were saying, look, you're essentially... Um, outsourcing the production of all of these military weapons systems to these other countries, right? Because Saudi Arabia would say, okay, if I'm going to buy these planes from Lockheed Martin, then Lockheed Martin needs to build a factory um, in Saudi Arabia that is going to assemble or produce some component that then is later um, integrated into that weapon system. And so this was, this became sort of a domestic uh, politics issue. But to me, it, it immediately struck me that, well, this can't possibly, the money can't possibly be coming from these defense firms. They would go bankrupt if they were actually uh, financing these kinds of investments. And so through really sort of years of reading lots of industry publications and doing interviews with people, it became very clear that uh, these defense firms were just tacking that cost onto the contract and then charging the procuring country government for that. And what that um, did was create sort of a huge slush fund um, that financial industry experts saw sort of um, as, a, as a major um, uh, you know, opportunity for them. And they stepped in and started creating these offset brokerage firms. Um, offsets are essentially sort of like blood in the water of the global financial system. And so these uh, financial actors can 
you know, smell that like sharks and they're, and they're, and they're drawn to it. And as a result, the offset industry has blossomed into this extremely complex and complicated industry that marries, you know, arms dealers with investment bankers. Um, offsets are, are, have been implicated in a huge range of bribery scandals. Um, I think Germany and South Africa is a, is a good case where essentially, um, you know, the German uh, government said it had paid to build a factory somewhere in South Africa. And then when somebody actually went um, to do some due diligence, discovered that the factory had didn't even exist, right, except on paper. Um, and they're also sort of um, sold to critics as a form of industrial participation or um, development projects that are, that are being led in the developing world by these defense industrial corporations, right? So uh, Lockheed Martin says, you know, look, we're being good corporate citizens by going into these countries and helping them diversify their domestic economies. Um, and a lot of the regional, especially in the Middle East, but also in, in places like South Korea and, and South Africa, and some places in South America, um, a big impetus for the growth of domestic defense industries was these offset agreements, right? So Turkey manufacturing, you know, F-15 uh, fighter jets, that process originated through an investment agreement, uh, through an offset agreement. And so offsets really proliferate the production of weapons abroad, um, they proliferate uh, sensitive technologies abroad, and there's really very little um, U.S. government oversight of these projects. So that same uh, government agency, the GAO, the Government Accountability Office, you know, went to some of these factories in, in other countries that were producing inputs for these wep U.S. weapon systems, and they were like, hey, look, there's no security here. You know, they're inviting uh, third party foreign officials to come tour these sensitive weapons production facilities and they're proliferating these technologies and they're selling them on um, to third parties and, and not recording that. And to the defense firm, of course, this is like a built in benefit because if you're proliferating all of these technologies to all of these other parties, then that firm can go back to the US government and say, look, um, we lost our qualitative edge. We need to develop new next generation systems because all of you know the previous generation systems are are in uh, control of of all of these third parties, and and we we don't have a, a technological edge anymore. So you need to fund some additional research and development so that we can uh, develop even better new weapons that they will then uh, turn around and and proliferate um, again. Um, offsets are also used um, as collateral right, as a, literally as a financial tool by the procuring countries to qualify for more loans to buy more weapons systems, which is, you know, sounds insane. But if the country can say, um, look, uh, we expect to get investment equaling XYZ, and that's going to build a factory, which is going to produce um, this much uh, money in, in exports, then they can actually use that as collateral um, to borrow on global markets, and then they use that money to buy additional weapons. And so, of course, the defense firm has an interest in, in helping that process along also. So this is really expanding sort of the global supply chain of weapons producers um, and creating new domestic defense industries in many countries in the developing world. Um, in addition to Turkey, Israel uh, built a lot of its current um, domestic defense industry through uh, previous offset agreements with um, U.S. firms. Um, and uh, the growth of offset brokerage firms has been really extremely dramatic. So there's tens of billions of dollars in offset agreements signed every year. Um, they've been made uh, confidential in the U.S. Um, because industry went to the U.S. government and said, look, you can't uh, be asking for this kind of information and recording it. Um, the Bureau of Industry and Security in the U.S. used to actually require that firms provide this information. You know, where are the offsets going? What countries? What's the equipment? How much is it worth? So they were producing, you know, 30, 40, 50 page reports on, on this, these activities. Um, the defense firms didn't like that. 
And so they lobbied the U.S. government to make it um, confidential. So now there's really no information at all collected on any of these things. Um, and in many European countries, there's uh, enormous numbers of, of offset brokerage firms sort of popping up um, to help firms manage these contracts and then to also act as fiduciary agents on behalf of the procuring country governments. And so everyone, um, the procuring country government, the defense firm, and this huge sort of complementary industry of, of financial actors um, have an interest in in promoting and growing this industry, which acts as a, a dramatic tool for the proliferation of, of weapons and for the growth of the industry overall. Um, and because the weapons industry is not immune right, to the forces of financialization, it has become a real site um, for uh, increased uh, focus from um, financial actors and for uh, financial investment. Um, we see similar sort of trends and patterns in uh, venture capital and private equity firms sort of uh, turning their focus on the defense industry also because um, budgets are so huge and so reliable. Um, so there's all of these all of these sort of uh, financial um, factors that are all sort of pouring into the defense industry and just making it larger and larger every year. Um, and I think that's something that we should all uh, sort of be um, cognizant of and, and try to fight against. Um, thank, thank you, Dr. Martin. This was very uh, clarifying and <laughs> important uh, information that uh, also kind of um, pushes us to, to wonder, like, um, as, as uh, Stephen mentioned earlier, that the latest report showed that there's a, a more, around $2 trillion in, uh, as an arms sales last year in the year of a pandemic. So how, how like, not just, so now we are in, in the second section of the panel discussion. So my first question is, how is this uh, investments being put in, in all these military spending and, and for the arms sales and all these stuff and for lobbying as well, kind of takes money away from solutions that society needs. We have investment in hospitals and education, all these stuff uh, that really matters for society, that really is the security of human beings. So. Can you elaborate on what are the forces behind it? What are the needs or what are the forces and how um, the media also like uh, plays a role in that to, to kind of divert the discussion from important things? Um, and feel free who, who would like to start uh, just to... Um, I mean, I can say um, something briefly. Uh, I was writing a piece for the Middle East Report, which is part of the Middle East Research and Information Project, which is a great organization that I'm a part of. Um, and I was looking into this specific question, sort of how content made it from the defense industry into think tanks and then into the media to promote like sort of continued um, militarization. And the uh, Center for Strategic and International Studies is a think tank in DC. And you know, it, I think 17 of its top donors um, are military firms or firms uh, like insurance companies whose primary uh, sector is uh, insuring um, military contractors uh, that are overseas in Iraq and Afghanistan. So they're all sort of defense military adjacent companies that are donating primarily to, to CSIS. Um, and there was money given to CSIS to do a study on the U.S. defense industrial base, right? This was in, I think, 2014. Um, and CSIS uh, published a report that said, um, you know, it looks like, uh, they said, it, it looks like um, the number of uh, military defense industrial firms in the U.S. has gone from, you know, 78,000 to 68,000 or to 61,000, so a drop of like 19,000 over the past three years between, you know, maybe 2014 and 2017. And they said, you know, uh, the, if you look at the language of the report, they clarify, they, they say, we don't know actually what happened to these firms. Maybe they changed their name. Maybe that they got bought out by a bigger defense firm. Maybe they started making civilian technologies. Um, maybe they acquired 
a third party firm. And so they changed their name together. We don't know what happened to them. We just see that they're not still under that same industrial code um, in U.S. government uh, reporting documents. Um, and so that conclusion that was in the CSIS report made its way into sort of defense industry publications as this sort of hysteria over the declining defense industrial base in the US. And then it eventually eventually ended up in the New York Times and the Washington Post and the Wall Street Journal um, that declining US military spending was creating a crisis in the US defense industrial base and that all of these companies were going out of business where none of that was present in the CSIS report. Um, I mean, that's what they tried to indicate in the language and the rhetoric uh, of the report, but none of those actual conclusions are anywhere supported in um, the data that's in that report. And yet it, it, it flows into the sort of the, the mainstream media as, you know, the, the disappearance of the US military industrial base because of declining budgets. Whereas, I mean, the budget never declined. It grew at a smaller rate, but there's never been an actual decline. Um, and so that it's really, it's really dangerous um, to see how uh, firms promote a particular kind of research in particular institutions and how that uh, is permeates into sort of the popular, um, into popular media and how misleading it really is. Okay. Um, yeah, I think if we look at Europe, uh, we also see uh, rapidly rising military budgets in the last few years. I think uh, a lobby from uh, different angles uh, comes together for this. Um, I think, yeah, what I already discussed in my presentation was the lobby by the military industry for higher budgets uh, and for securitization, so militarizing the uh, the so-called solution to a lot of problems uh, like migration, like climate change, like even pandemics. Uh, uh, lobby organization of the European defense industry uh, really put forward that higher military budgets are part of this, uh, are part of the answer to uh, to the COVID-19 crisis, for example. Um, uh, but I think there are also other factors playing in. There's the pressure from uh, from within NATO uh, on in European uh, NATO member states uh, to have higher budgets uh, to increase it of, uh, to 2% of the uh, gross domestic product. Um, uh, I know many uh, armed forces themselves are saying uh, they desperately need more money. Um, and yeah, I see it uh, challenge very little. Uh, everyone seems to agree that more money for military is needed and uh, everywhere uh, threats are presented, uh, be it, uh, yeah, I like to discuss refugees as a threat, but of course also uh, Russia, China, instead of looking for cooperation, looking for diplomacy, uh, a new arms race is going on. Uh, higher military budgets. So I think there's a lot of uh, work for us to do to counter this. One thing uh, I'll add just really quickly to cap up two really excellent responses is uh, oftentimes you'll hear the justification for increasing military budgets uh, on the basis of job creation and that there's very few manufacturing jobs left in the United States. The first, or in pretty much any sector, but you know the, the problem with that is one, um, or I guess the biggest problem is that, yes, military spending does create jobs, but if job creation is what you're after, military spending is the worst possible way to go about it. Um, Cost of War Project usually has something out every couple of years, at least, that shows that military spending creates about seven jobs per million dollars invested, while green energy and infrastructure create like close to nine. And healthcare, uh, uh, produces almost twice that of an equal investment in military expenditures. And then education is something crazy. It's like two and a half or three times as much. So oftentimes you'll hear saying that like, oh, well, we need to invest more in defense because it, it creates jobs. It's like, okay, yeah, I mean, it does. But I mean, it'd be a lot better to take that money and invest it elsewhere if that's what you truly care about. 
Great. Um, thank, thank you all for this elaborate um, answers and highly needed. Um, so we often hear something called revolving doors, like when uh, individuals sit on uh, corporate uh, boards and of arms industries, and then in, in the uh, sits in the government offices, and then afterwards on the media uh, stage. So how does in Europe, but also in the US, the revolving doors work and are they kind of legal or are there restrictions for such uh, uh, employment uh, behavior, if, if I can put it that way? I can start off with a short comment in the US, if that's okay. If, uh, Mark, I'm actually really interested to hear Mark's answer. Um, I think the, the one thing that there are prohibitions in place uh, regarding this sort of uh, revolving nature between government and private industry, then back into government. But I've noticed that, uh, especially uh, for executive positions, those there's often waivers granted, um, and that there has to be a what they call a cooling off period between um, being in the private sector and then going back into government. Those are frequently waived. So with the uh, Lloyd Austin, the now uh, Secretary of Defense, there's a waiver for him for the previous Secretary of Defense or a couple back, I guess, General Mattis, James Mattis under Trump. He was also granted a similar waiver. So there is a problem, um, but oftentimes those rules themselves are just are almost performative to an extent because it doesn't address the problem, which is public officials gaining an immense amount of access through their public service and then coming out the other end and then exploiting those connections, that access they have for the benefit of um, profit seeking corporations. Um, I can just add a quick comment, which is that like there are actual formal programs in the US government um, to take people from industry um, and from people who are, you know, doing, people who are scientists working in sort of military research firms and actually put them into government posts as a form of like exchange, right? So um, all, many U.S. government agencies have these programs. So the Department of Energy has an experts exchange program. You know, uh, the Department of State has, um, has one also, but the Department of Defense has, you know, like 10 times as many <laughs> of these pipelines that are specifically uh, meant to bring industry um, people into the US government so that they can sort of learn how it works. And I'm sure that if, if anyone actually ever did a study <laughs> of that, they would find that those people do end up sort of recirculating um, between industry and uh, the US government. And then of course, in strategic consulting firms, which, you know, it. You, if you're in a strategic consulting firm, uh, you might as well be in the U.S. government, right? Because that's pretty much what you're doing, right? Is acting on behalf of whoever your former employer was as a strategic consultant by um, being a government relations expert who goes on to Capitol Hill every day and explains to the staff member of a particular congressman why this weapon system is superior and and why it provides X Y Z uh, benefit to um, to the United States, you know, national security or whatever. So it, it, even if there is sort of a, a law, it's pretty much irrelevant. And there's so many ways to get around it um, that it doesn't actually function effectively as, as any sort of deterrent. Yeah, I think in general, it is more of a problem in, in the US than it is in Europe. Uh, of course, more there, um, but there are some striking examples in Europe as well of revolving doors. I mean, the current European Commissioner for the Internal Markets, which includes uh, the defense industry, uh, uh, came directly from uh, from Atos, a company that's also active in the military field, um, and the other way around, uh, former. Uh, I think president or vice president of the European Defense Agency is now uh, working uh, at Airbus. Um, and yeah, you see a lot of other people, uh, especially from the military, uh, after they retire, uh, ending up on boards of arms companies or consultancy. Uh, indeed. Um, 
I'm not completely sure about formal procedures, but I think there is at least officially uh, there needs to be a, uh, when people retire from a government position, uh, uh, there's uh, there needs to be some time. I think it's half a year or a year uh, before you pick up a, a position in, in, uh, at the company. Uh, and they need a waiver if it's a company in the field that they used to work in. Uh, but uh, but it happens all the time. I mean, the the, the high profile case of this uh, ADA, of this president of the European Defense Agency, which is now working at Airbus, uh, ignored the rules, for example. Great. Thank, thank you all again. That's very insightful. Um, so to move a bit, or not to move a bit, it's still in the same, like we see now in Ukraine, there's a buildup of militaries, like NATO soldiers, as well as the Russian. Um, so just to, would like to ask about, uh, is, there, is are the, the same forces as we, we learned in this discussion to now, uh, be, like in the US or in Europe, also similar for the NATO? I mean, we know the US is the major player there, but um, so, are, are there specific think tanks that work with the NATO or no, there are similar think tanks or like the same ones, but they just have kind of departments regarding NATO. Um, if you can please elaborate on it. And if there are any specific uh, think tank that we should, we should be aware of uh, in that regard. I really don't know much about this, so I hope one of the other two is able to answer this. Um, I mean, I'm not sure um, if there are specific think tanks that, that work um, sort of uh, on behalf of, I guess, NATO. I'm sure that NATO has its own sort of internal um, think tank um, that produces research um, that's uh, requested um, by military leaders, um, but there are plenty of heavily militarized think tanks in the U.S. There's more than enough to supply all of NATO with um, any justification they want um, for any sort of military activity. Um, I mean, I'm looking back at this thing, this uh, piece that I wrote that I mentioned earlier, which uh, says 12 of the 25 most cited U.S. think tanks um, receive most of their money from weapons manufacturers. Um, and I think that actually came from FAIR, the um, Foundation for Fairness and Accuracy in Reporting, um, FAIR.org, which does a lot of really great work tracking um, uh, defense industry sort of influence in the U.S. media. Um, but there's also, you know, lots of um, strategic think tanks emerging in the in the Gulf countries and the GCC countries that are producing, um, as expected, you know, the kind of research that those governments are looking for, which is basically, um, you know, that uh, that Israel is a good ally to have strategically, um, and that Iran is a major threat that needs to be countered in the Persian Gulf, um, and all of the sort of uh, very sort of hawkish um, neoconservative. Uh, policies that you would expect um, to come out of those um, organizations. So I, I'm sure it's the same with NATO, but I'm, I don't know specifically. Great. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, so um, uh, <clears throat> I would try to, to, I mean, all these uh, military apparatuses, they consume oil. And uh, so and we, we see a lot of bases from U.S. bases are located in very strategic areas where there is, for example, uh, the Middle East. Um, but I would, would like to cover another angle, like, for, for instance, uh, Timothy Mitchell in his book, Carbon Democracy, talks how life size were kind of engineered so that uh, demand in oil would increase. So, for example, SUVs, for instance. Um, so from your you research, did you, did you see any collusion between the oil corporations and military industries so that all these weapons, the conventional weapons, they consume oil and receive like almost $2 trillion trade in uh, arms sales. So is there any collusion between the two so that at the end, the two sides of the, of the equation just benefit on the cost of the society? And, and sorry, just a question uh, uh, from Mark for the European uh, arms industry. So 
the minute the, the US is kind of the, almost the biggest, but uh, European industries or sales are kind of relatively small compared to the US. So I'm, I was wondering, like, are these sales kind of just a, a small door for bigger economic contracts they receive from 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 the states that are buying these weapons, for example, the uh, are the oil rich countries? Um. Uh, yeah, well, I think the largest European arms companies are still in the top ten of the of the largest uh, arms companies in the world. So I think uh, they are quite large themselves. Um, but yeah, European arms export policies are also an instrument for uh, EU foreign and trade policies in, in general. So. Uh, uh, yeah, part of the reason that many countries are. Uh, we're reluctant to have an embargo against Saudi Arabia, for example, is about uh, about uh, about oil. Um, uh, yeah, uh, so that and yeah, sometimes uh, uh, arms exports are also used to get more access to markets in general. Um, so yeah, in that sense, it could be as you say. Um, um yeah uh, what would i want to say about the other question um i think most part of the of, of international military strategies be it the eu or nato or or the united states uh one of the most important things is uh is uh getting and maintaining access uh, to fossil fuels um, so that they, that think it plays a role in, uh, in, uh, in military strategy all the time. I'm not uh, completely sure about the role of fossil fuel industry simply because I never looked into it. Uh, but I know they are connected. I remember uh, uh, that uh, the Dutch government, for example, granted an export license for uh, petrol boats to Nigeria. Uh, saying that one of the reasons uh, that they granted this license, uh, even with the bad human rights situation in Nigeria itself, uh, was because it would uh, benefit uh, the interests of Shell uh, in Nigeria. So yeah, it plays a role um, in military and arms trade policies all the time. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's great that you mentioned Tim Mitchell's book. Um, his research is really um, interesting. Um, I mean, you know, after World War II, right, uh, part of the Marshall Plan was about converting Europe from coal to oil, right, um, because there were lots of U.S. Uh, independent producers also that were very politically influential um, that had a great interest in converting the European economy to run on, on oil also. Um, so it wasn't just like, uh, you know, the suburbanization of the United States, right, which required an enormous amount of energy and personal automobiles um, that would run on oil. It was also about the U.S. trying to, uh, you know, alter um, other countries sort of uh, energy reliance um, also. Um, I mean, the, the link between oil and arms or some people write about it as, as petrodollars right, is, is very clear and goes back a long way. Um, I mean, Saudi Arabia, uh, one of the biggest arms deals ever, Saudi Arabia paid for in oil, right, the Al Yamama deal with the UK, which um, just Google that because, you know, you're, it will blow your mind, the amount of corruption and bribery um, that has been proven to be a part of I think what is now is still the largest arms contract in, in history. Um, basically, uh, Saudi Arabia paid um, the British state in oil um, for all of this uh, weaponry. Um, and I think that uh, I think it, it was BP and Shell, you know, then sold the oil on global markets, uh, kept a massive amount of it as a as you know their contract to pay them to pay them for the trouble. Um, and then what was left over um, went to the British treasury. Um, because oil, of course, is sort of like hard currency, right? Um, a lot of countries can't don't have access to hard currency to pay for weapons, but no core capitalist weapons exporter is going to accept 
anything other than like dollars or euros in payment for weapons, but they will uh, accept um, payment in oil, right? So in that sense, it's like a fungible commodity. Um, oil acts as currency um, in that exchange. And of course, the relationship between the core capitalist countries who are trying to keep afloat um, these industrial jobs in a post-industrial sort of scenario, um, who are their major clients uh, for weapons purchases? They are oil producing countries because they have such an enormous amount of liquid capital that's coming in from the export of oil because the production of oil is extremely cheap, right? So it may cost you five cents a barrel if you're selling it for $80 a barrel. Um, you know, the, the rent that you're getting off that difference is enormous. So you're accumulating uh, such, a, such a large amount of uh, capital and then you're investing uh, the returns from previous years. And so that's additional <laughs> oil money that's coming in because of all these, um, all these countries have large sovereign wealth funds. Um, so they have, you know, uh, basically lots of money sort of floating around um, that needs to be invested sort of in a political outcome. And that political outcome is getting a security guarantee from the U.S. and Europe and other uh, increasingly other sort of lower tier weapons producers, you know, uh, China, um, India, South Africa, South Korea, Israel. So it's definitely sort of a political relationship that is just uh um, expedited through this relationship between oil and weapons, I think. Okay. Um, thank you. Thank you again. Um, a couple of, a couple of questions before we move to the Q and a, um, um, so regarding lobbying, is there any, uh, foreign interference, like foreign countries lobbying for themselves, for their interest in the U S and Europe and how does that affect it, their their foreign policies as well and this is the first question and uh, second question is how do the us and members of the european union kind of break their own laws by exporting weapons to states or regimes involved in atrocities for example the uae and it's the war on yemen the israeli apartheid for instance so can you elaborate on these two different uh, to these two questions uh, that's possible. I'm happy to speak a little bit to the first question regarding foreign lobbying. That is uh, that is an issue, and there are uh, sort of uh, shortfalls with it when it comes to how much data we have available on it, because there's a lot of, uh, I guess, foreign interference that doesn't necessarily qualify as lobbying, even though it's aimed to steer policy. Um, it also, uh, the foreign influence also runs through think tanks, for example, Center for American Progress, which is the U.S. most quote unquote progressive think tank, um, or at least mainstream one, um, had an actual UAE official, United Arab Emirates official, write one of its policy papers. So this is one of the, one of the things that uh, incentivizes countries to have sort of a path in because it's a way to uh, not only gain access to uh, sort of official to steer laws or certain provisions in your direction, but also to sort of cleanse one's image as well. Um, if you go through um, sort of progressive institutions. I mean, they can also, um, you, it, it's more about, right, um, funding the organizations that are already promoting your point of view, right? Um, it's not necessarily a tit for tat exchange, although that um, the case of the Center for American Progress was very um, uh, clearly sort of tit for tat because they actually, someone got copies of the emails, <laughs> right? So that was a, a very sort of clear cut case of, um, uh, I guess, influence peddling. Um, you know, but they also, you know, contribute to uh, sort of right wing leaning universities. Um, where they know the professors are going to produce content that promotes their point of view, right? But they're already sort of promoting that point of view, but that's the way um, those institutions and organizations continue to exist and uh, can amplify their point of view is by getting money from um, 
you know, from foreign agents, from industry actors or whoever um, is looking for a place to to amplify whatever their ideological viewpoint is. Um, in terms of uh, limit, limitations on exports, I mean, you know, it, it's always a very sort of um, limited um, rule. You know, there's never like a real embargo. Um, it might be a limitation on new licenses, right? It, as in the case of the UK and Saudi Arabia, they wouldn't issue new licenses for different weapon systems, but the previously existing licenses, you know, remain sort of in operation so that they can get the spare parts that they were getting before anyway. So it's sort of promoted as, uh, you know, taking action against these, uh, gross human rights violations, but it's uh, it's leaving most of the relationship intact, right? So even when there is, and when there is an embargo, you know, half the time, the, the people who initiate the embargo, like the United States, doesn't observe it anyway, and they just um, allow for the transfer from, you know, from Saudi Arabia um, to a third party anyway, right? So <laughs> even if there is sort of an embargo in place or some sort of formal agreement, um, they're constantly um, undercutting that um, either legally or illegally. And when they do it illegally, no one suffers um, for it anyway, right? Because they usually have um, either presidential immunity <laughs> um, or, you know, really good lawyers. So. Yeah, I would say it's pretty much the same in Europe. Um, there is an EU common position on arms exports uh, that gives eight criteria that uh, countries have to check against the, uh, when uh, when giving the arms export licenses, but they are so broad and fake uh, that's really a question of implementation and uh, it never uh, prohibits or uh, any kind of uh, uh, kind of exports and uh, yeah of course there are binding so-called binding uh, uh, embargoes on UN and EU level as uh, Shana mentioned uh, but there's always a way around them and no one's gonna hold people uh, or, or governments to account for it uh, um, and as for foreign lobbying yeah I don't know much about it uh, there, there's not much information about uh, about these things of course uh, uh, but uh, yeah, there are some examples. I know Israel has been lobbying really for its uh, privileged position uh, regarding uh, EU funding. It's uh, basically the only non-EU, non-European country uh, that's eligible for which companies are eligible for uh, for EU military research funding. Um, and I know Saudi Arabia has been really uh, busy lobbying against the restrictions on arms exports. To uh, it. Or, or there's no enforcement mechanism, right? Who's going to enforce it? Um, and in the United States, there are sort of government agencies that are tasked um, legally with enforcing um, these rules and, and regulations, but business uh, leaders lobby their congressmen to cut the budgets specifically of those agencies that are tasked with oversight and regulation, right? So you may have one um, government sort of contractor oversight person who is in charge of hundreds of contracts, right? And it's impossible for them to actually regulate any of these activities effectively. Um, and industry knows that. And that's why they consistently uh, promote policies that uh, cut the budgets of uh, these agencies. Um, and it becomes an ideological viewpoint, right? It's about small government, limited government, you know, letting the free market get on with the job of producing, um, uh, you know, economic growth and prosperity. But what it's really about is limiting the ability of, um, of regulators, uh, monitors and, and overseers to actually control any of this activity effectively even if they are legally tasked with doing so they're it's they're completely incapable of handling it so this is i mean this is the terrifying but um, so the question is what can we do so what can citizens uh, political parties who are engaged in anti-war movements and uh, activists can do to to push against this so 
I would, I would ask you all, Mark, with your work at Stop Weapon Handel, Stephen, at the uh, co with cooperation at the Security Reform, uh, Security Policy Reform Institute, and China at uh, China at the uh, Security and Context in, uh, Initiative. What can we do to to push against this? That's uh, the question. Oh yeah, it's a very difficult question. Uh... First, I want to say, uh, I have an eye on the comments, and I really want to say that I'm very much in favor of abolishing and dissolving NATO. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, working against the arms trade um, is very hard, I think. Uh, it's often possible uh, to challenge specific exports. Um, I mean, there was quite a lot of opposition uh, against uh, arms exports to Syria, for example. Um, and there are other examples like that. Um, but if you really want to get to the court of the issue, you have to challenge the underlying narratives uh, for arms exports, uh, for militarization, uh, and uh, promote uh, uh, vision, uh, alternative security vision, uh, one that's based on uh, diplomacy, cooperation, uh, uh, sharing, uh, yeah, a completely different uh, policy than the current uh, military and capitalist policies. Uh, and yeah, I think that has to be done in any way, every way. It has to be done uh, by, by lobbying, uh, by publications, uh, by writing letters, uh, and then a whole set of activities you can do up until uh, demonstrations and direct action to challenge. It's, I'm afraid there's no uh, like um, one magic thing that we all have to do uh, to change it. It's uh, very hard work and it's uh, really going against the tide in the current times. Yes, I, I echo Mark in that there's not necessarily one thing you can do uh, without leveraging your position and finding what you're good at uh, um, within your sort, of, your sort of realm. It can be labor oriented. Uh, for example, during the pandemic, there are several uh, factories in the United States that um, wrote public letters via their unions or directly um, had to publish in local or national newspapers that said, basically, we have the capacity to make ventilators, we have the capacity to make masks. Um, right now, we're for load or we're making, you know, fighter jet engines. So that's one way. Another um, could be just um, interactions with government just going through and, and figuring out uh, how your politicians are funded um, and basically making a huge deal out of, uh, out of uh, relationships with military contractors, especially due to the nature of it. I mean, um, you know, taking cash from, you know, private, you know, medical firm or uh, private energy firm or private defense contractor, you know, putatively the same. Um, but I think, there's more you can do with uh, sort of relationships with military contractors because they're contractors, they're contracted from the federal government. So in my mind, it's a lot easier to sort of fit that into the discourse on inequality and corruption because uh, they these firms are generating most of their profits from the public sector, um, which a lot of people don't know. Um, a lot of people are, are unaware of, of contractors as well. So it's about uh, not just finding uh, uh, sort of your niche and uh, um, finding out sort of uh, what you're best at and most interested in. Um, I don't have a very good answer for that. I mean, I guess um, as an American, the best thing you could do would be to not pay your taxes, right? Since most of it goes to the Department of Defense. Um, but uh, I think making life uncomfortable for people, uh, for industry executives, right? Um, so just, you know, uh, yelling at them in restaurants, right? Not, uh, you know, letting your kids play with their kids at play dates. I mean, things like that where you're actually sort of undermining someone's social standing. And when you do it directly to the individuals that are involved in that industry, I think can be very productive. Like in the US, um, a lot of the Trump administration officials were sort of verbally berated very publicly, um, which was frequently caught on camera. Um, and you could tell that that actually really took a toll on their ability to like go to work every day and, and 
continue, you know, the destruction of the country that, of course, has been initiated under previous administrations for a very long time. But uh, afflicting the comfortable, I think, is one way of doing that. Um, and then, of course, uh, supporting direct actions, right? So, like when dock workers refuse to load weapon systems onto uh, cargo uh, ships, um, any way you can you can support actions like that um, uh, financially or or physically, I think is is also um, something that we can all do. Thank, uh, thank you all. Um, so before we move to the Q&A, there's one more question to, to Stephen. Like uh, you mentioned that the, to see who, like, who, or try to get in contact with the Congress uh, woman or man. Um, so I was wondering, I, I assume that you had already experience with that when you contact them, try to, to, to uh, brief them on something or uh, give the, provide them with research data. So can you elaborate on your experience with, 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 this, with that approach? with uh, engaging Congress broadly, you mean, or? Uh, I won't speak about my personal experiences, but I, I think some tactics that work uh, extremely well um, is just being nice to the person you reach out to um, and being very brief in your position. You can, don't be afraid to come off as terse, but you can't be rude to the person. It's not, this isn't about no kind of, uh, you know, bowing down it's about just being courteous a lot of these congressional staffers are overworked tremendously overworked and underpaid and a lot of the discussion the subject matter here is far beyond a lot of what they even heard about so sometimes they're lazy you know uh, sometimes their boss is terrible but you know in general if you're going to approach an office and that's the route you're going to take then uh, definitely be nice. Thanks for the meeting, et cetera. Um, but as far as, as far as forms of advocacy go, um, that's a very small piece of it. I think, I think it's more to show it's easier to walk in a meeting with you have, if, uh, and get that meeting in the first place, if you show that you're representing an issue that's broadly popular, so there's just a hell of a lot of work that has to go on to give you a certain amount of credibility to, before you go in. Um, and it's sort of one of those things where you have to make it make sense to that other person and that doesn't necessarily involve you know uh you know hysterics usually great i guess we reached the end of our panel discussion we have a couple of questions from our audience so one of the questions also for Stephen that uh, it was so i'm gonna read it it'd be interesting to know from Stephen the longer term historical trend of the private privatization proportion of the Department of Defense funds. What was it 20 years ago, 40 years ago? Shane, I know this better than me. Uh, I don't really, I can't give you a specific number. I, I think um, over, over the last 20 years, at least, that's remained somewhat stable. Although the one thing that I do keep my eye on is industry consolidation. So since, uh, the top six uh, weapons manufacturers or military contractors uh, last year, if you trace back to the 80s or pre-Cold War, those six firms, just sort of if you traced it back on mergers and acquisitions and that sort of thing, those six firms were once, you know, 270 firms about that they sort of coalesced throughout that time. And what that does is that it's sort of when when uh, certain military military contractors get sort of a dominance or hegemonic control over the market, um, they sort of it 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 becomes less about competition between those forces and more about sort of working together and collaboration. Um, so they do compete with one another over huge contracts. Of course, that all happen, but overall, if you, it's about sort of uh, um, not just about privatization, but also sort of the hierarchy that's built within. Because again, remember, there's about 50,000 military contractors um, and five get awarded over a third, sometimes close to 40% of all the contracts in a given year. So um, we're not having an exact number. Yeah, I actually don't know the answer to that question either. I mean, but a lot of the costs that are not sort of weapons procurement um, are 
you know, push to other parts of the budget, right? So like contingent budgets for contingency operations overseas, right? So actual, actual wars, right, are not included in that sort of official DOD budget. Um, so it's also the case that it's extremely difficult to ever develop any kind of time series data or actual comprehensive figures um, about military spending or even, you know, the number of firms involved or um, the proportion of exports in their uh, corporate profits or anything like that um, because they intentionally obfuscate all of this information and they divide it into different industrial codes. So it's impossible for you to actually get like a reliable figure. Um, so even, I, I think it's impossible actually to ever answer a question like that. Um, but they, they do, in, in, you know, push more and more sort of personnel costs and other costs off onto other um, budgets so that that sort of procurement budget for uh, acquiring weapons um, can remain very large. Um, so uh, that's also something that makes it really difficult to say, I, I think. Um, we're going to take one more question from the audience and also please take the chance to also kind of give your last uh, or conclude with your opinion on it. Um, so the question is, uh, to what extent do you think the military industrial complex incentivize countries to go to war? So please, um, feel free. Um, Mark, if you want, go ahead. And then Stephen, then we finish by, with Shana. Oh, yeah. Again, this is hard to say. Uh, it plays a role, um, uh, but I don't think uh, the lobby from the military industrial complex alone uh, would drive countries to go to war. Um, but yeah, but it's part of it. Just as uh, just as a lot of other things. Um, so yeah, I really don't have much more to say about uh, about this question. I think. Go ahead. Uh, as far as uh, I'm not sure if its role in you know incentivizing other countries to go to war, um, but I know that it is instrumental in sort of the U.S. keeping its imperial presence abroad. And I don't think sort of the U.S.'s endless wars, as it's, as it's called now, I don't think they fell from the sky. I think they were born out of an imperial posture, and I think I think it's, it's all. I just point in the conversation how the military uh, industrial complex, especially the private interests, is reinforcing that posture abroad. Um, so that's, that's what I can sort of, uh, it's my general answer to that question. Um, I mean, you can look at things like share prices, right, uh, that are on, on trading indexes for defense firms. Um, and see that they are that they track directly with um, war and with U.S. announcements about um, pending conflicts. Or uh, I remember when I, I mean, you know, Trump made some announcement about uh, improving relations with North Korea, and the stock for a number of defense firms like plummeted <laughs> immediately. Right. So there is a a, a direct connection. <laughs> Um, between U.S. foreign policy um, and the share prices of private defense industrial firms, right? That's uh, very clear. Um, and the financial and professional and personal interests of an enormous number of sort of middle-class professionals are bound up in the pursuit and the continuation of uh, wars overseas, Right. So, you know, people who you would think of as only secondarily or uh, tertiarily related to the defense industry still rely uh, essentially on conflict um, for their own, um, you know, for their own like standard of living. Right. People who organize arms trade fairs abroad. Right. These huge like arms trade conferences. Uh, people who uh, do photography for defense industry publications like Defense News or Aviation Weekly. So if you if you really think about it, there's so many people whose 
um, livelihoods are bound up in this industry that you really have to be able to dismantle that connection by replacing it with something else. Um, otherwise, you have really a built-in um, impetus uh, for continued conflict. And it's not that I think those people are lobbying the U.S. government to, um, you know, to invade Syria or anything, but they develop through inter their day-to-day -day interactions with other people who also work in that industry, a certain outlook, a certain understanding of history, uh, a certain understanding of geopolitics um, and, uh, and war that contributes to the continuation of those conflicts, right? So you, I mean, the entire system sort of has to be um, dismantled with other and replaced with other, you know, with green energy, with uh, civilian conservation corps, you know, with all of these other projects that can give people meaning and give them uh, some quality of life that is not directly linked to the war machine and the continuation of uh, conflicts. Yeah, uh, one, one, one last question is, um, so we recently heard that uh, the US uh, military is also investing in, in i guess 21 billion dollars in like virtual reality research and also recently with the also autonomous uh, weapons and autonomous autonomous drones like wondering like how is the relation between universities research and the military and how i mean how problematic because it, I mean, the military presents itself as a, an r d pioneer somehow so if you can quickly or shortly elaborate on it if you you have any experience with it. I mean, I've been reading a lot about venture capital and, and private equity um, in the defense industry. And what I'm seeing is that, uh, you know, a lot of sort of uh, tech startups um, are getting uh, financial investment from these sec from these financial actors because uh, they have some technology which has some military application. It's not necessary, necessarily that they're develop, developing it to be used by the military, but someone from a, you know, a venture capital fir uh, firm or a private equity fund comes in and says, hey, you, know, you could get a lot of really huge government contracts if you modify this code a little bit so that it could be used by unmanned aerial vehicles, you know, weaponized drones. Um, and then, of course, they're going to get an enormous amount of investment. And then the trajectory of that startup firm is forever changed and securitized and militarized. Um, so that's something that I'm, I've definitely read a lot about in the past uh, 10 years. And it seems like that's going to be the probably the, the trend going forward. Uh, yeah, the, 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 the relationship between arms companies and universities is uh, high on the list of things that I want to research uh, in the future. Uh, I think in general, the relationship is getting closer and closer. And I think one of the most important drivers for this is uh, our reductions in the spending on education and the universities uh, getting more dependent on third party funding. Changing that uh, would help uh, to get uh, these relations uh, less close. Yeah, one of uh, echoing Mark. Uh, one of the things that would be tremendously beneficial for setting that relationship is just having alternative sources of funding, especially federal funding. Again, I mean the contracts that I rep that I talked about earlier. I should have included that uh, you know about five hundred billion funding contracts were given out last year close to 440 went to the military. So there's a serious problem here um, that, you know, if, if a company or um, an organization or an, in, or an academic institution is seeking money from the federal government, just sort of by virtue of how the, how the government is sort of funds itself, has a limited number of options. So ideally I would sort of, and this, this could be relevant to sort of uh, academic organizing by faculty or students is to sort of push for uh, conversion between um, between combat and climate funding disparities. Um, and that disparity is is truly massive. So I think I think that uh, that those that those relationships exist between sort of academic institutions and arms manufacturers. So it shows sort of a, a hubris uh on the on the account of arms manufacturers just get 
how so much organizing in the past has been at college campuses. Great. Um, unfortunately, we are, we are running out of time, but um, I would like to thank you all for, for joining us for, and for this insightful and clarifying uh, discussion and information. So again, thank you all and we really appreciate it. Thanks. It's been great. Nice to meet everyone. Thanks for having me.